Labdien, labrīt, cienījamie konferences. Good morning, dear participants of the conference. I am very glad to see all of you online this time, but with this we are opening the conference which is devoted to anti-corruption day and the internal control system. My name is Janis Brazovskis. I am a member of the board of the Finance Latvia Association and the ATET board member. And this event, I am the moderator. As every internal control system, it starts with the correct attitude of the owners. And so therefore I am very pleased that this event is opened by our prime minister, Mr. Karinš and the floor to the, his speech. Labdien, sveicināt visiem korupcijas novēršanas apkrošanas birai rīkotajā diskusijā tieši par pretkorupcijas tēmām. Nenoliedzam mūsu valstī šī ļoti svarīga tēma, nevelti valdību un saimi piešķiruši korupcijas novēršanas apkarošanas birojiem krietni palielināt finansējumu, lai mēs varētu stiprināt savu skadrs, stiprināt savu cīņu pret korupciju. Šajos ārkārtas apstākļos, Covid apstākļos, es domāju, ka šī biroja un šīs jomas darbība vēl jau svarīgāk, jo mums tagad ir izsildināt ļoti daudz ārkārtēju iepirkumu, tiek iepildināt diezgan lielu naudu papildus mūsu ekonomikā un ir ļoti svarīgi izsakot, ka šīs naudas tiešām sasniedz savu mērķi un ka tur nav negodīgas rīcības vai no organizētāja vai no saņēmēja puses. Tātad es novēlu visiem ražīgu diskusiju. Es uzskatu, ka viņi ļoti svarīgi. Es domāju, jūs esat īstie cilvēki tieši uzināt šo tēmu un es aicinātu pievērst īpašu uzmanību procesiem, kas notiek valstī tieši saistībā ar papildus finanšu līdzekļiem, kas tiek piešķirti tieši Covid-19 ekonomisko saka samazināšanas vai likvidēšanas dēļ. Paldies un veiksmi jums visiem! all the more important, because now we have a lot of extraordinary procurement procedures. So thank you very much to the president of ministers for encouraging words. And the next, uh, I would like to give floor to the director of the Com Corruption uh, Combating Bureau. So the floor to the organizers of this conference. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much that we are in such a large numbers and it means that this uh, topic is important and uh, we have to speak about it uh, as much as possible. Today, and when we begin the International Anti-Corruption Day in our new situation, we are meeting online in this 4K discussion. I would like to add the fourth K, the fifth K. Why? Uh, in, why this internal control system impacts the corruption for organizations for public organization and private uh, organizations daily life is like a life uh, at home which uh, we can visualize because if at home there is more order we are sure we know where each thing stands and if we have agreed about internal rules at our home it's easier for everyone and opposing example if there are not the rules of play in in a house there is a chaos nobody knows where the tv uh, remote control stands and also uh, nobody knows why the child wasn't taken to the kindergarten so the same refers to the companies if there are not the clear states of rule then there are risks for uncoordinated and unlegal activities so all these rules of play are organized by this internal control system this internal control system is getting more and more important when the 
there are ordinary circumstances, uh, the situation is more clear. But now, when we have this extraordinary situation, we have to make procurements, we have to solve many issues, and those uh, risks of corruption are increasing, and therefore, the significance of internal control is also increasing. So therefore, we are devoting today as conference uh, to 4K. We are asking, what are the questions for, and uh, what are the meaning of uh, internal controls? in this daily crisis uh, for the companies which participate participate in state and municipal competitions so thank you very much to everyone for participation and let us have a fruitful discussion thank you <clears throat> Good day once more to everyone. Thank you very much to Mr. Straum for opening speech. And I will speak a little bit about this house uh, and the order in the house. So we will start with an international dimension. And just in a minute, I will give floor to our colleague Franz Chain from the OECD. Uh, and they have just uh, published a study which is uh, in English called Anti-Corruption Compliance Drivers and Mechanisms and Ideas for Change. And this study uh, shows um, the areas in which there are possible to have improvements and uh, for international companies, but also for uh, smaller companies and what we can expect from our control systems and, and what is expected from the collaboration with the state, not uh, uh, only in this situation of crisis, but just uh, everyday situation to fight the corruption risks and other risks. And also, if we talk about our internal uh, rules, everyone can ask questions. You can use the application Slido and you enter uh, hashtag for conference, so number four conference, and uh, these questions will be visible. And so use this platform for your questions and comments. And now I'm giving floor to France. You are very welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to be able to present this study on corporate anti-corruption drivers to this audience. I guess that is one of the very few benefits of here at the OECD and also the Latvian um, School of Public Administration. So I'm gonna launch, share my screen now. There we go. So um, in carrying out this study, uh, what did we want to do? Well, really we wanted to understand why companies adopt uh, anti-corruption compliance mechanisms we wanted to understand how they assess their risks and develop their compliance programs, their internal controls, uh, and also understand what are the obstacles that they're still facing. And, and the objective of, of finding these out was to identify ways to encourage companies and especially small and medium-sized enterprises to uh, adopt such measures. That was one of the objectives. And the second one was to inform governments, to inform uh, policymakers on ways that could incentivize companies to adopt internal controls and compliance measures to prevent and detect corruption. The study uh, was largely developed based on a survey of uh, 130 companies from about 30 countries and follow up interviews with company representatives, mostly compliance officers. Uh, the companies uh, that were represented were generally large multinational corporations, but we did have about 10% uh, of uh, state-owned enterprises and about 15% of SMEs. They came from all over the world, although the greatest contingent was from Europe. They all conduct business internationally, and they represent a variety of sectors. You can see some of them in the pie chart here. Uh, often several industries, uh, but um, these range from healthcare to manufacturing, transport, energy, finance, and, and so on. So first of all, uh, you can see on this slide a, a brief overview of what the study covers. I'm not going to go into all these chapters here, but this gives you an, ideas, an idea of the different um, chapters that are in the study. It's available online uh, in English. You're welcome to go and, and read it in more detail. So 
first of all, the drivers, which is why companies adopt anti-corruption measures, and I'll spend a bit more time on this today. Secondly, how do companies assess corruption risks, which was really at the core of developing any uh, mechanism um, of, of anti-corruption compliance. Then we looked at models of compliance, what sort of measures do companies adopt, and this goes into the different mechanisms that companies put in place, from the codes of conduct to the training, um, these sorts of things. We looked also at resources that are available, and this goes from advice provided by governments to more maybe country neutral aspects of international organizations or international business organizations. And uh, we know also companies look to their peers to um, seek inspiration on best practices in the area of compliance. The challenges, well, in 2020, compliance is no longer in its infancy. And so we wanted to know, let's say about 10 years after uh, an, an era that saw major development in the, in the field of compliance, we wanted to understand what the challenges were. And again, this is something I'm going to spend a little bit more time today on. And finally, because of course we wanted to draw some conclusions, uh, the view ahead and the way forward, and this is to some extent sort of a, a wish list uh, that we asked of companies, what they wanted, what they felt would be most useful in um, going further into the area of compliance. So for reasons of time, I'll focus on the drivers of compliance today and the challenges that are still faced by companies. And again, have a look at possible ways forward. So first of all, why do companies adopt anti-corruption measures? Um, we asked respondents to indicate the primary reason that a company took steps to implement a compliance program. But, but of course, you know, life is never black and white. Uh, there's often a multiplicity of reasons, but for um, reasons of simplicity, we asked them to indicate the primary reason. And the first reason that came up uh, and very, very largely, we're talking 80% plus, um, was the, the desire to avoid prosecution. It was a major factor in, in companies' decision to establish compliance programs. And uh, linked to that is a perhaps even greater percentage of companies that wanted to protect the company's reputation. And this, this, this fear of enforcement uh, and, and the reputational risks, it can take different forms. And of course, the first one we can all think of, I think, is that a company that is itself under investigation for corruption will almost certainly establish a compliance program or amend its compliance program to restore confidence, to possibly remediate if uh, prosecution authorities require it. But a, a secondary effect, which is very interesting, is what um, we refer to as the bystander effect, which is uh, where the enforcement, where the reputational concerns come from watching similarly situated companies undergo investigations and prosecutions. And um, so we had several respondents who indicated that they watched other companies in the same sector being prosecuted, they learned from their mistakes, or from the best practices that resulted and they implemented that. And uh, one interview, we explained that he'd seen uh, his competitors being under investigation, and they saw the financial results this had for these companies, and they concluded that the size of their own company could not support such a payment uh, of a prosecution or settlement, so they decided they had better put in place uh, preventive measures, so to speak. Um, and of course, where prosecutions span across many uh, countries, this has a, a broad effect in terms of bystander effect, and we had several companies from Latin America uh, mentioning that the Odebrecht Petrobras case uh, was really a, a wake up call for Latin American companies. And this is a situation, uh, I think perhaps you will agree, that is uh, somewhat reminiscent of what happened around 2008 in Europe with the Siemens scandal, which also I think brought the, the issue to the attention of, of, um, of many companies in Europe. Um, the second motivation that came out the highest was sort of more sociological internal motivation of doing business the right way. Uh, something that is a little bit less tangible, I guess, for us lawyers, perhaps, perhaps it's a sociological uh, study that uh, could, be, could be done. What we were interested in looking at was customer and investor influence. Uh, and that was 40% um, really of companies said that was a deciding factor. Uh, either because they wanted to uh, conduct business in the context of public procurement and the authorities uh, gave some value to having compliance programs in place. This is the case, for instance, as well of some uh, international development banks. Uh, we know we have colleagues in the uh, EBRD uh, that have some compliance requirements. So that can be one reason why companies would develop such programs. But also um, half of the companies said that um, obtaining non-governmental contracts was a deciding factor. So basically somebody, 
either a venture joint venture partner or an investor or a majority shareholder was requiring them to have in place compliance measures. And that was a deciding factor for many companies. And that's uh, the sort of uh, pressure that can be a particularly strong motivator for small and medium-sized enterprises who want to maintain relationships with larger companies. And so, for example, um, where a large company requires subcontractors to sign their certification, uh, if this happens often enough, then uh, the, the small company uh, may choose to adopt their own policies. And that was actually a specific example um, that an SME managing director, who was also the compliance manager, gave us. He explained that um, a lot of the large companies that did work for either required the, com the small company to have a code of conduct, or if it didn't have a code of conduct, then they had to respond to a very, very long list of additional questions about ethics in order to get hired for the job. And so after a while, he explained, it was just easier for the SME to develop its own code of conduct rather than having to go through this process again and again. Um, so uh, he, he, he actually realized that the process was fairly simple if you could just uh, take the time to produce an internal mechanism and really apply it. So uh, an interesting uh, motivational factor for, for SMEs, which was one of the angles we wanted to look at. And um, last but not least, of course, legal changes can be a strong motivator. We know some uh, legislations recently in our countries, uh, the OECD, like Colombia or France, have adopted legislation that specifically requires companies, generally above a certain size, to have in place anti-corruption compliance mechanisms. So, of course, needless to say, when you have to do it under the law, you do it. Um, the other legal change could be a change in the company's activities. So for instance, one US company, they undertook uh, a corruption risk analysis and uh, further developed their compliance program when they were acquiring a company in Latin America. Similarly, a state-owned enterprise, uh, they uh, were going to sell some of their stock to the public. Uh, and so the company management thought that they wanted to convey confidence to all potential shareholders. And so they developed a, a compliance program on this occasion. So that's, that's for the look at the drivers of compliance. And I'll now turn to uh, the challenges that companies, that compliance officers say they still face today to uh, make anti-corruption compliance effective. So what is the uh, first obstacle that was mentioned by uh, the people we, we surveyed and the people we interviewed? Well, it's the um, executive commitment and the trust of management. And that is surprising, frankly, it, I think it's a little bit disappointing. Uh, but still a large majority of respondents, they said that executive commitment was a challenge. And we've all heard the phrase tone from the top. It may seem overused, but at the same time, we know it's essential to have the board on board from the very first moment you go about setting up your compliance system. Um, you need them from the very start. The very start is the risk assessment. Uh, compliance officers, and one specifically said, it's just about the most important thing a compliance officer might do this risk assessment. It's, it's where you identify the business nodes where your company is most likely to encounter problems. It's where you create already the mechanisms and controls up front to uh, hopefully prevent the wrongful conduct. And it's unique to each enterprise. This is, um, so, so it's really the point from which the entire compliance process uh, will be rolled out. And, while, of course, there are many functions in the company that need to be involved, uh, from the legal department to internal audit and procurement and sales, you need management's involvement um, at this important stage of risk assessment. And without the high-level management support, then really your risk assessment runs the risk of just being a purely academic exercise without any practical impact. So uh, for that reason, it, it could also be linked to the, the, the driving factor that I mentioned before. Uh, this is why perhaps enforcement is, is really useful as a driver because when all else fails, if you go and tell your, your, your chair that there's a real risk that you're gonna be prosecuted, then you might get them to listen. Uh, linked to that probably is the, it will never happen to us. Uh, and, and this was something that, again, came up a lot in our conversations. Uh, over half of the respondents said they had to fight a perception in their company that the compliance program is not needed. And this often comes down to the fact that corruption risks are intangible until you have an incident. So it, again, it links back to the first thing. How can you stop that perception? Well, it often starts with executive commitment. 
Um, another factor that came up and always comes up and never gets old is the lack of resources. Resources, of course, continue to be critical to effective anti-corruption compliance. And, and the problem is that compliance is still very often seen as a cost center and obtaining resources can therefore be difficult. You've got on the one hand, the risk of corruption, it's seen as just a potential threat. And on the other hand, you have the risk of losing business and that's seen as a much more immediate and concrete threat. And of course, again, looking at smaller companies, uh, the tension can be even greater because of course, unlike the very large companies, they cannot spread the cost of developing, of implementing a compliance program across a, a very large uh, business. And of course, this is very closely linked to the pressure to make profits. And several interviewees really regretted that this was often at odds with the importance of a compliance program. And, and we had some very drastic measures uh, suggested. One company representative uh, went all the way saying he'd like to kill the bonuses because they inherently conflict with ethics. So I don't know if that's really uh, feasible in companies, but uh, another suggested perhaps more reasonably that key performance indicators should include anti-bribery compliance. And um, just to finish on these two factors, um, these are challenges that are that, that were very real at the time we conducted these uh, interviews. This was uh, at the end of 2019. And since then, well, we've all gone through this COVID-19 crisis. And of course, these pressures are likely to increase, uh, not just because of COVID, but really because of the economic crisis, uh, which will strain company resources even further. Uh, and again, uh, you're going to have a very real risk of losing money versus a potential risk of engaging in corruption. So it's gonna probably become an even more critical issue for a lot of companies. And in addition, the current pandemic, the impossibility to travel will make it probably difficult for large companies to really root their anti-corruption compliance program worldwide across their organization. Uh, because really for a program to be effective, uh, you need to be able to adapt it to local needs. You need to meet with people on the ground. There's um, there's only so much you can do from headquarters. Uh, of course, uh, you need a you know sort of a consolidated uh, uh, assessment, uh, evaluation, rolling out of a, of a program. But then you really need to go on the ground to effectively convey your program to your local branches, possibly also to uh, your third parties, your supply chain. And you need to communicate and rely on local personnel. They have the trust there. They know the people. They know the risk, the cultural hurdles, possibly. And not being able to physically travel to meet with your teams and engage with them on, also on a human level is, is uh, probably going to make this uh, particular challenge even greater. And finally, um, just a minute on the importance of maintaining momentum. So once you've sort of over, overcome all these uh, challenges, the risk is that once you've got the program in place, and sometimes also once you've got certification achieved, which is something that is happening more and more, there's a risk that everyone will just get more relaxed and consider that uh, this is done. And compliance officers really stress that that is not acceptable to them. Um, they don't want to hear managers saying we are done. Uh, a program is continuously growing. The program is never done. Uh, we have to keep improving and finding better solutions. So following this brief overview of some of the concerns businesses have voiced, I'll attempt to sort of um, distill these findings into a, a few key suggestions that could um, help companies, help the international community, governments to more effectively uh, fight corruption by supporting uh, corporate anti-corruption compliance. So first of all, I'd like to have a look with you at what compliance says they need. Well, of course, they need a seat at the management table in the form of appropriate executive support and appropriate autonomy. They need a compliance culture, which of course has to include very clear company standards, but also very regular communications to all members of the corporations. Um, communication to convey that you are effectively serious about your commitment to integrity. And this means working together uh, this comes back to the, the, um, something that I already mentioned about having a central team, but working with local personnel. And uh, also beyond the company, it means uh, engaging with other companies to exchange best practices, either uh, companies in the same industry as yours or operating in the same geographical area. Um, there can be, of course, opportunities for collective action, um, for instance, in the context of a particular public procurement uh, contract. Uh, companies can also work together through business association to create um, standards of expectations, 
And uh, this uh, can be particularly helpful when we talk again about small and medium-sized enterprises. What would companies want? Well, they want co government commitment, and that includes effective enforcement. Interestingly, that's something they insisted on. Uh, it's important to, to have timely enforcement, to have fair enforcement from both sides of the equation, not only uh, prosecuting those who pay the bribe, but also those who receive them. Um, and this has to be, of course, in line with the application of the rule of law. Um, I'll, looking at the time, so I'll, I'll go over uh, to, to uh, the next one. They also want clear standards on anti-corruption compliance. Uh, that's to say clear legislative requirements, but sufficiently flexible to allow companies to adapt their program to their needs. And they also want assistance. Uh, assistance mainly in two forms, one in the form of analytical tools, that can be provided to companies to help them assess their corruption risks, uh, but also to help them demonstrate the concrete benefits of having anti-corruption compliance in place. And this perhaps comes down to the issue of resources, showing that it's worth it, that it's not just a cost center. Uh, but companies, they also want concrete assistance in a much more concrete form for governments. They would like incentives or compliance. At the minimum, they would like compliance to be recognized as a defense in legal proceedings if they get prosecuted. But they also would like positive incentives uh, to virtual companies, as is done, for instance, in other areas, such for companies that adopt green technologies, for instance. And that they suggested could take the form of tax incentives or tax rebates, or at least public accolades for anti-corruption efforts. And finally, what can the international community do? Uh, well, they can also help in educating and assisting companies by developing uh, learning about corruption, including through case studies, I and mean, this is something that we care dearly about at the OECD, uh, we'll continue to strive to do that. There's this study, of course, but uh, to mention a few recent ones, there's uh, a study on the detection of corruption, including within companies, on uh, non-trial resolutions, also called settlements, on um, the flip side study, as we call it, which is looking at how uh, corruption from the demand side is being prosecuted. And also the international uh, community can also offer uh, real and virtual fora to discuss these issues. Um, the international community can also help break down uh, silos because while of course our specialty in my division in the interruption division is looking at corruption, we know that compliance personnel are also dealing with antitrust requirements, with money laundering, counter-terrorist financing, environmental concerns, human rights, and of course, uh, looking for ways to create synergies between these different compliance fields can really help advance compliance globally. And finally, uh, of course, the international community can help uh, by taking steps to support and even sometimes participating in collective action efforts to fight corruption. So uh, in conclusion, um, I think the, the positive side is that we see that companies want to fight corruption. Uh, they do not want to fight it alone. They want to see governments walking the talk, as they said, uh, by supporting corporate anti-corruption efforts, by enforcing their laws effectively, and themselves operating with the highest standards of integrity. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention, uh, invite you again to read the study available online, and of course I'm happy to uh, take a few questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you, France, for a very comprehensive... Yes, uh, have a look on uh, on uh, our slide or application. Unfortunately, there are no questions there. I would like to remind that we should use Slido for asking questions. Hashtag for conference. If there are no questions from the audience. I probably can take that privilege as a moderator and ask you some questions. Uh, I'm always puzzled. You mentioned also in your presentation that uh, probably. Th um, over the industries, understanding of compliance is uh, not uh, even one, I guess, that I'm coming from a financial industry and uh, definitely we are more advanced, if you want, in a, in a, in a compliance. I am not very uh, sure that uh, probably it's the same to the other industries and your report and your study also proves that. So uh, my question is how to disseminate that uh, over the industries and how to make those, uh, uh, you know, guidance for the industries more focused for a particular industries because probably there is no uh, one size fits all. And what is uh, OECD view on that? And are you going to 
you know, deeper in those studies and uh, what's your, your plans in this field? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this question. You're, you're very right, of course, the financial industry, because of the anti-money laundering rules that have been in place for quite some time, um, is more familiar with the issue of compliance, uh, although not necessarily so focused on, on anti-corruption. Um, in the study, we didn't dig deep into industrial specific standards, uh, but it's, it's very clear that what we've always highlighted is that any compliance has to be uh, focused on the company, and this begins by being focused on industry. And those companies that tend to have better uh, developed compliance mechanisms in the field of anti-corruption are generally those that interact a lot with the government, because the more occasions they are of interacting with government officials at several points of conducting business, the greater the risk that there might be solicitation for bribes. So uh, companies that uh, operate in um, the construction sector, in the extractive sector, uh, generally, to, to mention but a few, and also growing the healthcare, the communications, they tend to be, um, to have better, well, better developed or better knowledge or more awareness of the importance of compliance. Um, what we do, frankly, at the OECD, to be honest, uh, there aren't that many of us. So we, we're, we're counting on the dissemination uh, through the line. So to talk about this study specifically, we've, um, I think it's triggered the interest of a lot of um, uh, business organizations. And I know I've spoken to six or seven uh, conferences organized by international chambers of commerce in different countries. Uh, and really the hope is that it will trickle down at the industry level or at the local level. And we are hoping in the new year um, to actually conduct work that would be more specific to SMEs. It doesn't, I know it doesn't exactly answer your question about industry specific, but reaching out to small and medium sized enterprises is a challenge. So we're hoping to gather good practices in this area and, and hopefully disseminate those as well. Uh, thank you. And actually, uh, we have received a question on a slide, and the question says, unfortunately, anonymous one, but could you please mention any effective anti-corruption measure from your experience, Franz, or control effective already in companies? Uh, and particularly, you mentioned SMEs, and probably you could focus more on SMEs, because uh, if you look on a, a composition of our uh, economy, then definitely SMEs are, 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 are the main drivers in, of our economy. And uh, if I'm a, I don't know, chair of the SME, it's a question. I am the only one. How can I implement the effective control system in my company? What should I do the first? Who I should uh, assign that, uh, you know, responsibility for effective uh, internal control? Um, I, I think that's a very good question. Um, I'll answer it in, in, in two ways. First of all, one of the challenges that was mentioned, and one of the first challenges was executive commitment. Um, and this is something that actually at the SME level can be resolved more easily. Because there aren't you know, thousands or tens of thousands of people in the company, if the head of the SME is truly committed to effective anti-corruption or other compliance uh, measures. It is much easier for him or her to make sure that everyone in the company knows about that and to walk the talk, so to speak. So while the resource issue is certainly a very valid one for SMEs, I think the tone from the top should be less of an issue for SMEs because either the leadership is on board or it's just paying lip service. And, and that will very quickly be felt within the company. So assuming that there is a true commitment to anti-corruption compliance from the leadership in the SME, um, what we tried to do 10 years ago, and it was generally well received, um, 10 years ago we, we adopted in 2009, um, it's, 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 it's the Annex 2 to one of our recommendations, it's called Good Practice Guidance on Internal Controls, Ethics and Compliance. It's a very brief document, um, it's about two pages long, and it really uh, highlights in very simple elements what are the key um, points that you need to have in place for effective compliance programs or measures. And they're fairly simple. So it goes from a uh, course tone from the top to making sure it's felt as everybody's responsibility in the company, um, to making sure you have clear policies on the giving of gifts, on hospitality. It goes through a list that's, again, fairly simple. And following the adoption of this uh, good practice guidance, which, by the way, we're hoping to update again in the next year, 
um, following the adoption of this practice guidance, we published um, a handbook on, on, um, on internal controls, ethics, and compliance. And the purpose of this handbook was also to hope to clarify there's a lot of instruments out there, some developed by international organizations, some by business organizations, that all uh, purport to um, indicate what should be uh, compliance standards. And we thought it could be confusing to have all these instruments. Let's just all bring them together and show that they're basically all saying the same things, sometimes in a different order, sometimes in different words, but really they're all saying the same thing. And let's illustrate each of these standards with an, a concrete example. So we worked with companies to develop this handbook. It's again available on, on our website. It's, it's freely accessible. And so it brings together the standard that comes from the International Chamber of Commerce with the one that may come from Transparency International with the one that we developed at the OECD. They're all grouped together in one on one page. And underneath it, you've got two or three examples of companies and what they did in practice concretely to implement that standard. Thank you. So uh, there are some questions regarding the study, what you just presented, and uh, uh, they are very technical about who participated, which countries. Uh, like probably you just uh, can make some sort of advertisement where that study is available and everyone can have a look on that. Uh, actually, what I would propose, if, if that's okay, is that the PowerPoint presentation, which I've just done, could be circulated to um, people who uh, attended this con uh, this uh, conference today. And uh, on the very last page, I can also share it on the screen, but on the very last page is actually the, the link to the study. But if you type drivers of compliance, bribery, you will find it immediately. But again, post, I can, I can circulate my presentation today. Yeah, so, uh, and some uh, very short questions uh, also. Uh, regarding the, the commitment of, uh, of a management. Do you have any study about the role of the tone at the top when practically implement anti-corruption measures? Uh, no. <laughs> the short answer is no, we don't. Uh, but I'm sure you can find a lot of uh, material, academic and otherwise out there. Uh, that, that, uh, but it's, you know, it, it's about leading by example. It's, it's valid whether you're talking about a company or whether you're talking about a country, really. Uh, yeah. But, uh, you've got people leading by example it's very quickly going to be uh, perceived in the company that it's just window dressing okay <laughs> yeah thanks thanks and uh, some questions in latvian and, and uh, hope uh, interpreters will help me so uh, labrit uh, good morning so don't you think that it is more important to then. implement a single procurement system in public bodies than in private companies. The, the thing is, I mean, bear in mind that at the OECD, we're looking very much at companies that also conduct business other than in their own country. So uh, having the goal that worldwide, there would be one single procurement system is uh, not achievable to, to, to put it bluntly. Uh, and so the idea is that companies, even when they operate in countries with perhaps weaker systems of government, still have mechanisms in place that will help them prevent corruption situations. I mean, that is, that is the premise of many of our, of our studies. It's, it's really for companies conducting business internationally confronted with different situations in different countries and still having the sort of a solidity inside sturdiness to be able to withstand pressures, um, notably due to bribe solicitation. But it goes, it, it would be the same in respect of other uh, areas such as human rights or, or environmental concerns. The, the rules are not gonna be the same uh, everywhere in the world. So the idea is that you have built in some systems within the corporation uh, that will help you um, prevent and detect those difficult situations um, ahead of time. Okay, thanks. and. Uh... Probably the, the last question from the audience is, um, in your mind, for stronger internal controls, uh, do the public sector has to have uh, stronger controls or public companies? Both, I would say. Um, so our area of expertise is uh, working on the so-called supply side of bribery. Um, and I say, yeah. So called, but, uh, but of course, uh, having strong public governance uh, rules in place is, of course, very, very important. And this is something that another part of the House uh, looks at here. 
and uh, publishes uh, a lot of um, analysis on and also international instruments on transparency in public procurement, on rules and lobbying. Uh, so, so it's also something that we approach from a, a different uh, angles here at the OECD. We've also got colleagues working on, on tax issues or on issues related to official development assistance, which is also an area that is sometimes rife with corruption. So it is a multifaceted, a holistic approach that needs to be taken. Uh, this study looked at the importance of compliance in companies, but of course it doesn't mean that uh, there shouldn't be mechanisms for integrity in the public sector. Thanks, thanks, Franz. Actually, I have exhausted all the questions. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, it's about the time, and uh, definitely we are going to disseminate that uh, your good presentation to the our par participants. And once again, thank you very much. Take very good care over you and your colleagues yeah. and everybody. Thank you. Stay and safe, stay healthy. Stay thank safe, you. and uh, thank you very much for having me. And I wish you all a very happy holiday season as well. Thank you. Thank you. And happy new year. Happy yes, new absolutely. Year. Well, it should be better than this one, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> as always. Bye-bye. <As> <laughs> okay. Thank you again. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Uh, Paldies, Franz, par šo, šo prezentāciju. Thank you, Franz, for the presentation. As we agreed, colleagues will disseminate information uh, from CNAB and the state uh, administration school that, uh, forgive me, I didn't mention as one of the organizers of this, uh, of this, the, this event. After this international introduction, let us return home. Our, of course, we are also integrated in the global systems and, uh, and to a larger extent than we uh, imagine. And we will discuss that uh, with the next uh, panel when, and the next panelist. And today I'm very happy to introduce all the panelists. I will mention all of them and then we will speak with each of them individually. And these are people uh, with whom I really cooperate a lot on daily basis, especially with regards to internal control systems, um, on how internal control systems can help in business, how they serve can serve not only as a source of expense, but also as uh, something useful and I think all the panelists will tell that they perceive uh, internal control systems as something that helps to develop and also ensure greater profits. Now uh, I have the honor to present the panelists. Uh, the first is Lata Elksnija Zasherinska uh, from the Foreign Investors Council in Latvia. We also have Katrina Zarin from the Latvian uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry. That's a guy who most of uh, us know as guru in public procurement, but currently she works for the Ministry of Economics. But she is experienced in methodologies and she has also worked for the Public Procurement Monitoring Office. And I think she could tell some interesting things for us. We also have Linda Ozola with us from Riga City Council. I think it will be quite interesting uh, to uh, listen to her with regards to the tone from the top uh, because she has just taken over the respective office and, and she will tell what kind of tone she sees uh, and, and what uh, type of uh, uh, measures uh, she sees as being needed in her holding because there are many municipal companies uh, that she oversees. They all have procurement procedures and they are, uh, and these measures are very important to develop proper ecosystem in Riga. And also uh, we will have Jakob Straume with us uh, who will not only provide the introduction but also participate in the panel. And he's the director of the Corruption Prevention and Combating Bureau. Uh, we will speak about the enforcement and how the enforcement uh, can um, serve not only for punishment, but also for motivation, so that we all take care of the internal um, control system. Thank you. 
And now I would like to give the floor to Zlata Elksnina Zashirinska. Thank you. Good morning, dear participants. It's quite an unusual topic, but it is still very, very important for uh, our society uh, to speak about combating of corruption risks and internal control systems. And as a representative of the Foreign Investors Council, I would like to underline that for foreign investors, uh, the topic of corruption is quite topical for foreign investors. And we have conduct conducted um, investor surveys for several years with regards to, to how they feel in Latvia. And as a, result, as a result of these surveys, we have established that corruption risks do exist in Latvia. And quite often, corruption distorts competition. And if we speak uh, more about um, a possibility uh, for Latvia to attract new investment, it is quite clear that sometimes the existence of corruption scares away potential foreign investors because they just don't want to accept a system like this and they will they are more likely to leave than to stay and fight corruption with various mechanisms because quite often corruption is believed to be a belief uh, a matter of internal hygiene and uh, at the end i would like to stay uh, to say that we still have a long way ahead of uh, us to fight corruption because corruption is a kind of indication of the current development level. And judging by my experience, I can say that it is very important uh, to consider several factors. One of them is related uh, to uh, the process of awareness to what extent we speak about these matters uh, to what extent it is accepted in uh, in the society and mainly whether corruption is accepted or not accepted does it exist here and as a previous speaker was right uh, in saying uh, do we really have appropriate laws and regulations and measures to fight corruption and do we really have appropriate systems at the company level. And now I would like to point uh, to the following. Quite often when we speak about corruption or, or cases when foreign investors uh, face corruption, this is mostly related to large uh, public companies, state and municipal companies. And thus, internal systems in these companies, I believe, is one of the most important measures, uh, actions that should be taken to change the current belief uh, in um, in the existence uh, of corruption in Latvia. I really like that today we have guru, you are, uh, public procurement guru among us, because public procurement, as far as we see, is a place where corruption tends to happen. Thus, fighting uh, or combating corruption in public procurement most probably also during COVID uh, should be one of the main priorities. If we look at the challenges uh, or what the companies choose to do, to respond uh, or, or uh, to fight uh, corruption, I would like to say that many companies have chosen digitized processes because corruption is to a large extent related to the human factor. And the more we can reduce the human factor in various routine actions, the more often we are able to uh, reduce the level of corruption at the lower levels of decision-making. Also, my customers, when we speak about what we do uh, or what you do, they say we uh, substitute human processes with 
with digital processes. And I think when we speak about corruption risks, we have to think about several things. First, how companies should train their people to establish this culture of uh, no tolerance uh, for corruption. Second, how does the internal auditor works uh, together with the board and council and how important uh, these internal control processes are and to what extent they are established, whether they are a part of the general business process or they are something separate. Thus, they do not uh, uh, take on the required workload. And third, how good is the external system uh, for example, with regards to public procurement and to what and how well our law enforcement works, uh, like the uh, Corruption Prevention and Computing Bureau, and how these organizations cooperate. So, Thus, I would like to wish to all of us to be courageous in our fight against corruption and also introduce in our companies uh, internal control systems that will definitely help our businesses and will also help to uh, attract more business to Latvia. Thank you. Yeah, Lios Paldies, Lios Paldies. Thank you, Zlata, uh, for these introductory words. I would like to remind once more that you can send in questions also to other participants, not only our foreign guests, you can ask the questions in the same app using hashtag. I know that there is a term in Latvian for hashtag, but I, I tend to forget it. But in English, it's hashtag uh, 4K conference. But let us move forward. That's it. We have spoken a lot about uh, procurement, public procurement. You have uh, directly worked with these issues for uh, much longer than uh, the rest of us in the first line of defense. So what are your observations and your introductory um, words about the internal control system and interaction with the public procurement. What are your observations uh, with labā. regards to what needs to change uh, for us to generate better results and so that we could all together um, better manage uh, our common property? Good morning. Good morning to everyone who listens to us. Uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for giving me an opportunity to participate in this event. Today's discussion or the uh, matters included in the agenda of today's event are important, but they cannot be easily answered. Public um, procurement have, uh, have been the source of uh, suspicion and also uh, attempts to control them uh, since the First Republic. Um, in uh, the first law in nine was in this area was adopted in 1929. Uh, further development of public procurement uh, was uh, driven all the time uh, by uh, more stricter approaches, by more stricter rules. But even the EU court uh, had to admit that even if we have formal procedures that are accurately implemented, still. Uh, can may result in something that is not desired because if participants of the procedure agree about uh, dishonest actions that can result in uh, competition uh, restrictions in, in other problems that that eventually is not accepted or not liked by the society and and what that is not fair and then we also have procurement procedures that are not regulated by formal procedures and the latest developments related to COVID uh, have shown us that we have had many procurement procedures where the law was not uh, applied. So it is very important uh, in this regard uh, what kind of internal control systems each customer has for these procurement procedures to comply with the public interest. What we would like to see in public procurement uh, both parties, both the contracting party and the companies, uh, participants have a right to fair play and they also have a duty to be fair. 
And then the question is how to achieve that by punishment. Contracting parties are uh, afraid of various bodies like procurement monitoring office of CNAB and so on. But unfortunately, the practice shows that, yes, that can result in fewer such violations, but they cannot, or, but it cannot fully eradicate such violations. So it's very important to have ethical standards, internal uh, culture yeah, and the anti-corruption system in the company. And I think it's not even worth discussing uh, what comes first, the egg or the chicken. It's not worth discussing who was the first to engage in corruptive action as the, uh, the person who gave the bribe or who asked for the bribe. I think it's not important because there are always two parties. And I think that aligns very well with what we have already heard because the internal control system and internal culture should be in existence at both sides. And right, uh, Zlata was very right to mention that the internal control system should be integrated in the business processes. And only in this case, it will deliver the uh, desired result. And the same uh, applies to the anti-corruption control system in the public um, administration. If it's perceived as yet another document that should be written just for Knob to leave us alone, then it will not work because this document is dead when it is born. But when we look at it as a tool, as an instrument, as an opportunity to do what? What we are discussing today. I think this is another discussion about values in the public administration. What we as, uh, that we together have defined, defined together with the state chancery. Uh, and now we are speaking how to implement the, these values in our real lives. I think we today focus on the same, like efficient administration, eff effective use of public resources, openness, working for the public. I think we are still at the same spot. What we need in this case is to have the commitment to start understand that this is not a burden but a tool for better results and then just do it here it is very important uh, to have these actions at both sides in the public administration as well as on the business side and i hope that after this discussion we will have uh, many new ideas uh, namely where to start and we will also have the commitment and desire to start and that I uh, that I wish to all of you and also I wish a very good Christmas season irrespective of what happens to us. Thank you. Thank you, Adace, uh, for the tone that you set. I think uh, you were very inspiring. I think any of us uh, that works with the compliance, uh, we can just be happy that if our boards and, 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 and managers would have uh, the kind of attitude that DATSE has, I think then it would be much easier to implement any internal control system if you have the support of the management. Katrina Zarinja will be the next speaker. Uh, Katrina, thank you uh, for uh, reminding me of the hashtag translation in Latvian. So it's hashtag 4K conference, use Slido for questions. And I also have to say that uh, we will have a Jans, uh, the uh, chair of the board of the Latvian Chamber of Commerce uh, with us, uh, but today he had to go to a crisis management uh, committee with the ministry, uh, with the cabinet of ministers. So his event is very important, but we are happy that Katrina has joined us, uh, who will, uh, uh, who, will who is, uh, an expert who knows how we how the companies work. So, Katrina, your maybe introduction about uh, these topics from the point of view of companies, internal control systems, cooperation with public companies, public procurement, uh, uh, role of public and uh, of state and municipal companies in developing internal control systems in no, private quite. companies, and also if you have time, maybe you can also um, focus on public uh, organizations like your company, like financial industry association. So what we can do to help our members uh, and also as the study said, 
we play a great role in this, uh, how we um, develop the system, how we provide advice uh, with regards uh, to the internal control system. Good day to everyone and thank you, Janis, for the introduction and also for the question. I believe that this discussion and the question is a very topical and uh, in-depth discussion in the next stages is necessary. But I would like to start uh, with something different. So we non-governmental sector, the Chamber of uh, Industry and Commerce, we are uh, involved into the improvement of this regulation. Uh, from our side, from the side of our members, it has been always important uh, to, to have uh, this uh, regulation about uh, public procurement and also the uh, rules of competition so that it is clear and easy to understand and easy to regulate. Also today from the OECD presentation and report, we understand that the big emphasis has to be put on the small and medium enterprises. And we see it also here in Latvia that uh, the possibilities uh, for the small and medium companies to participate in the public uh, procurement has to be encouraged. And this is a very important factor for development of our economy. I would also like to divide this question into three large parts or three large visions. And the first one is uh, the vision of the public. Second is the vision of the company. And the third is the vision of the state. And it is very important how these uh, three groups uh, communicate between each other, uh, look for the common ground and create this environment and system which is understandable for everyone and also creates value for everyone. If we look from the point of view of the public, I would like to speak about one of the four Ks we are talking today about, and this is crisis. And it actually opened uh, the curtain for the public a little bit more related to the public procurement. And it um, made uh, the public to talk about these processes because uh, the public um, faced uh, this uh, situation when uh, when everybody was uh, all senses were very open everybody was looking around what the public management administration is doing so the public expectations to have the high quality service for a good price uh, we 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 felt these expectations for that and therefore uh, the necessity was increased uh, for the companies, for the state, for the contractors to think about the reputation, reputation of the uh, supplier and also the contractor to control this procurement and uh, to organize it according to the law and also apply it and Im implement it and also to be able to communicate to the society, to the public what has happened to this procurement. Also, I would like to separate the small and medium companies from the large companies and also from the public uh, capital uh, societies. Because what we see on a daily basis among our members of the chamber, we see that the large companies have arranged uh, their uh, internal system uh, many more times than the small companies and it is seen also in the uh, capital companies and, and and then we look at the small and medium companies and in this OECD report we also uh, heard about risk management system and a uh, uh, great role of it uh, in development of uh, the internal control system and also the positive benefit for the company. So in 
this area we must say that the small and medium companies in latvia not all of them i would say even the smallest part of them have established uh, internal risk evaluation systems and, uh, and are really applying them. So when we look from the perspective of the company, what is important? It is important to, to have the state as an educated and knowing um, company ordering something. And it can be oh, arranged and sold with standardized uh, requirements, also guidelines, which are developed together with the sectoral association. We, uh, it is very important to involve the representatives of the sectors to develop a more clear regulation to promote that this system is more transparent and uh, this regulation is uh, applied uh, uh, in a way which is easy to understand and all the involved parties understand why what happens and uh, the contractor is able to explain the goal of the procurement the requirements and also decisions made so therefore during the process uh, there are risks of arguing are reduced and also the time is reduced. Uh, time uh, period uh, is reduced, which uh, is be before, which is between uh, the announcement of procurement and then signing the contract. And so therefore the resources can be saved. And in conclusion, I would like to agree with an idea that everything starts from the top. It starts uh, from the state, the management of the company and executives, and, and this is the culture of our entrepreneurship. We are talking about it. We are also talking about uh, the change of generations, and, and this becomes more and more topical um, concerning the owners of the companies and also management of the companies. Companies are expanding and working uh, more in the international markets during the last 10 years. So therefore this participation in the international markets is a motivator to implement the risk management system and internal control systems and to become more competitive, both here in Latvia and also internationally, and also to reduce risks which are related uh, to the possible corruptive activities. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Katrina. Yes, um, for the next, I would like to give floor to Mrs. Linda Uazola uh, from the Riga City Council. Uh, Linda, you in the Riga City Council uh, tomorrow will also celebrate the Anti-Corruption Day and there will be also uh, an event organized for internal, related to the internal control system. And so this uh, underscores how important are those topics for the Riga City Council, the same as for everyone who is participating here and also listening to this conference. So. Uh, Linda, um, can you tell about uh, management of the capital societies? And uh, uh, we, we heard about this responsibility for the larger companies, uh, the state companies and municipal companies uh, um, to, to, in order to create this uh, compliance culture and the ecosystem. So, so the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers uh, uh, to also to speak about this uh, from the point of view of the Riga City Council. And I will speak about the more uh, topical uh, things uh, uh, to have this internal control system. It is one of our most important tax tasks and we understand that we need to strengthen it. And everyone who follows uh, uh, our activities, um, you've seen that uh, as to the regulating, uh, we have done a lot. We have developed the anti-corruption strategies and plan how to implement. Honestly speaking, uh, we must say that uh, in reality, implementation of this, uh, these requirements is not going so successfully. 
and it is proved by identified corruptive uh, um, situations and activities and we have heard a lot about uh, them in the public uh, space and um, many things happened uh, in the Riga city and it's in the future and now our uh, in the past and now our task is to be aware of the current situation and understand how to improve it and step by step move forward and uh, like the previous speaker said uh, the crucial things and what i want to emphasize in my introductory speech is that there should be collaboration between all the interested parties both from the companies who want to work in equal competitiveness uh, circumstances and also for Riga, where all most uh, economic processes are uh, concentrated and Riga is uh, setting the tone. And on the other side, the state management. Uh, the, their task is to ensure these honest, uh, uh, fair play uh, rules and to, to eradicate uh, um, all the unfair practices and the tone from the top uh, which was mentioned by the moderator and also OECD representative is one of the most important factors and actually uh, honestly speaking uh, we didn't have it uh, previously in the Riga city council so our political message about zero tolerance towards corruption, uh, not allowing corruption to happen. We have to deliver this uh, message, not only to the public, but also to the um, organizations and, and, and people working uh, in our uh, city council. So therefore, tomorrow we are organizing an event about internal control systems and responsibility. And one is communication to uh, reach uh, uh, the middle level of uh, our employees and also the public. But the second is also the creation of efficient risk management system. And in order for that to happen, we have to take a very concrete and um, um, strong uh, action. So we have to strengthen the role of the internal audit. And uh, for the capital companies, we have to give uh, this opportunity to use this audit. And we have identified that we put more emphasis on the audit um, uh, both uh, strengthening the human resources and also ensuring the um, training for the uh, raising the qualification. Another very important uh, step in identifying the risks and assessing the risks is uh, is as follows so irrespectively of the plans all the plans we are having uh, this uh, management um, involvement was very formal and we didn't have a risk assessment uh, measures and planning of risk assessment measures and uh, and implementing and doing this risk assessment and uh, for that as one of solutions we see the use of analytical tools also the OECD study uh, in its um, a wider scale, uh, which I uh, already read before the conference, also points to use of uh, these tools. And, and also it was mentioned today in the presentation. And it is uh, very closely related to accessibility of the data which can be used in the uh, risk management process. And we also see uh, two important priorities in the context of RIG. One is openness and of the information. Very often it's publicly uh, said that um, um, this, it's, there is a very limited access to the information about uh, the money used, the funding used. And also even for the members of the Riga City Council, it was very hard to receive the information how this money was used. Uh, also uh, in the uh, suspension bridge repairs, uh, um, we repaired the stairs 
and uh, the information how much money was used for this uh, was uh, publicly unavailable and uh, and one of the member of the par of our city council even uh, well, went to the court and so therefore uh, this is now available but of course uh, it doesn't mean that all the finances uh, sheets uh, balance sheets of uh, all the repairs is available but uh, the the issue is that uh, this uh, has to be uh, available because sometimes uh, these construction costs are, are even four times higher than than uh, they could be, and also now about Measure Park's uh, uh, construction object, uh, there is also a topical question. So one of our tasks is to, to have these data available. But second is open data and also data sets about use of financial resources. It is... Um, the way in which we are moving and we are working with a plan of action step by step how to ensure the implementation of this open data policy in life. Uh, also, next step is uh, that um, um, make uh, ensuring uh, uh, the uh, res taking responsibility and that has was a problem we didn't have a mechanisms which worked uh, in in the cases where uh, somebody had to be held uh, responsible we organized like um, ad hoc uh, commissions which uh, analyzed uh, the violations um, but now we have developed a whistleblowing system and uh, it is uh, working and we have received the first reports and now we are working uh, and to, in order to see what is uh, working very well and we are uh, looking for the ways how to make it more efficient and also meaningful. And now I'll speak about a couple of uh, challenges which we see which are our priorities and they are related to our activity of our capital societies we have 15 under the riga city council and like the colleagues who speak be, spoke before me outlined is that uh, procurements play a very important role in uh, the ensuring transparency of financial systems and in the large procurements this challenge is very very essential and because uh, there there are there could be limited uh, scope of uh, uh, competitors there are specific technical requirements uh, which doesn't allow to enlarge uh, this uh, circle of uh, participants so there should be the way how to organize public procurements but we would like also to have external assessment we have specialized institutions also in the state uh, who have an information an information which uh, could help us to make informed decisions especially in cases when where there are some suspicious procurements as to the fair and honest uh, management i would like to point out that at the end of august uh, in riga city council we adopted and approved uh, the requirements regulation about management of the capital shares in the capital companies and this is a very very huge step forward because there are a lot of uh, essential and important uh, things which are very precisely defined in those in this regulation but at the same time three months have passed and we see that not always the capital companies understand uh, what and how they have to implement what are the specific steps they have to make um, whether it's about the availability of the information to the public uh, or how to organize the internal processes for example when they organize the competition or um, they set the, the level of remuneration 
So there, there are still uh, room for improvement and like at school, we will have to go and walk together with the capital company step by step and see how to make this regulation real in life. And the third challenge, which I wanted to outline, which we have our uh, identified and it also resonated say, in the public uh, area, is about uh, under threshold uh, procurements and procedures, so-called under threshold procedures. So in all our uh, uh, system, you know, uh, there is a, a little bit uh, a different, a different regulation for different uh, capital companies. So that in order for the public not to be unclear how the competitors are choose, uh, how the company's uh, contractors are choose, um, there should be a united uh, regulation. And it is, it is very important that those are political priorities. Uh, being aware, like I said in the beginning, being aware of the role of the Riga City Council in uh, the state economy and also understanding that uh, ensuring a transparent uh, management is the question of our competitiveness of our country and also our city. So um, thank you very much. And we can also discuss uh, all this later in the discussion. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, very encouraging uh, opening speech. And the next uh, speaker is Mr. Jakob Straume. Um, Jakob, uh, um, about your role, not just an institution uh, who punishes, but like uh, Linda said and others say that communication and feedback uh, about uh, the whistleblowing channels um, uh, which we needed to establish uh, according to the law and some had already before the law was adopted. Uh, so about these aspects and also what you as a controlling institution, what do you expect from us and how we can collaborate and also about internal control systems and meaning of them. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I must say that it is um, easier to be the last speaker but also more difficult because a lot was already said uh, also in the OECD presentation it was very clearly shown and it was uh, there are uh, things which are easy to understand even uh, if uh, an individual doesn't understand what is internal control system and why it's needed so it was very clearly explained uh, so therefore, I would like only to touch upon uh, what we as a bureau, we see. Where are we as Latvia, as our state in the implementation of internal control systems and uh, how we operate? Because honestly speaking, uh, our, our um, understanding is that in many places, those systems are implemented just formally. So a little bit about the theory. First of all, we consider that there should be a desire, a wish uh, from the policy, state policy makers, a wish from the side of entrepreneurs, and also a, a wish from the public administration, institutions and capital companies and other, uh, the desire for this system to work and operate and operate honestly and uh, with integrity. And uh, with that, we would achieve a better result than where we are now. You know where there is a wish and uh, a wish uh, of the public sector and private sector collides because um, the public sector wants to receive um, the products and services for a competitive price. And then there is a desire from the entrepreneurs to make money, to, to make profit. They are entrepreneurs and they want to make profit. So before we have, uh, um, we talk about balancing of those uh, 
to wishes, we cannot talk about reducing the risks of corruption in our state. So I would like to say from uh, our practice, from our experience, uh, corruption cases have never happened uh, just because only one side wanted it. The only one side wanted to have corruption because uh, very often I am not trying to uh, defend the entrepreneurs who were involved, but sometimes uh, they are forced uh, to to uh, be in the situation and, and 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 because they want just to make money, because from the side of the public sector, it's been done everything possible for entrepreneurs to uh, make illegal agreements on prices and to involve in uh, corruptive uh, uh, schemes and as a result uh, the interests of the state and, and of the public suffer and we uh, don't receive the service for uh, 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 good uh, and uh, reasonable price and also the environment of entrepreneurship uh, gets into the position that, 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 that because there is no competition, there is also no development. Uh, the companies are not getting stronger and, uh, and not striving to win the competition by their quality. And as a result, everyone is suffering. Also the entrepreneurs, also the uh, state administration uh, institutions, and also the persons who, of course, are involved in these corruptive activities. So this is uh, like a circle for, for, for this uh, um, uh, circle and uh, the only way how we can break it is uh, to have a desire from the state administration uh, side to have these internal mechanisms, very strong mechanisms, and also to, to have the management of each, each institution to, to, to have uh, this transparent system and to control everything, not to have these corrective activities so that the persons or officials who have to deal with the, those uh, issues uh, do not get corrupt. Also, about the political wish and desire. Corruption Prevention and Combating Bureau, when we initiated the regulation of the Cabinet of Ministers about uh, the internal control systems and uh, about uh, avoiding the conflict of interest in 2017 when those regulations were approved in the cabinet of ministers uh, before that we received uh, very serious counter action uh, in order not to move forward these regulations but we created them we established them and they were approved and um, in um, uh, 2018, uh, December 31st, they were approved, and then soon it's going to be two years. And all uh, the state institutions had to uh, implement uh, the internal control mechanisms. And if they were not implemented, uh, the uh, management uh, had to be called responsible. Um, it was hard process after a year when we um, tested, checked uh, the institutions and received the information from thousands of institutions. Um, uh, the numbers were not uh, very uh, uh, good. Uh, the situation has improved, but uh, I'm returning back to what I said. I saw, I see that in many places these internal control systems are just formal and we have to make them really start operating. And then we can uh, see that uh, from the um, side of the state, we we have uh, institutions with a strong internal control mechanisms and those mechanisms wouldn't allow involvement in corruptive uh, 
relationship. And at the same time, also we expect the entrepreneurs to do the same. But of course, we will never receive good results if it doesn't happen at uh, simultaneously at the both sides. So it is just a short summary where we are now. Uh, also, I wanted to speak about whistleblowing, yes. Right now it is a regulation which uh, brings even better results than we expected. As a bureau, we um, receive the whistleblowing reports and a part of them, about third of them, are um, like one third uh, in one third of cases, we really uh, see the violations and we are not the organization which receives the most number of whistleblowing reports at the state revenue service, but uh, it is a very good, very good situation. And we can say that during the last year, the situation is improving every year, step by step, we are uh, seeing the changes in the state management and also in the entrepreneurial environment. But as Mrs. Uazola already said, um, there should be um, more methodological approach in reducing the corrupt risks of corruption. Also, we have to work both with the public sector and private sector and OECD representative said that uh, OECD is uh, focusing on the cross-border international uh, bribery and uh, it is important to make the system uh, more honest in all OECD countries that the member states, the companies, entrepreneurs who participate with that participate in um, the procurements um, uh, wouldn't allow uh, the bribery and corruption. So irrespectively, how strong is the state uh, administration in uh, each country, but uh, so that uh, there is a network of companies which uh, just uh, could uh, ho hold this uh, um, good uh, tone of ethics. And also in Latvia, we have cases where we have investigated and uh, worked with cases in collaboration with other countries. So therefore, my conclusion right now would be that the situation is improving. But of course, we would like to have it uh, faster. Thank you. Yeah, paldies. Uh, paldies. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, for the introduction, introductory words. Currently, we have a technical break, which will be very short. We will resume in 10 minutes at 11.42. Let us resume at 11.42. And we will resume uh, by questions to the participants, and then we will have a discussion with all the panelists. panelists uh, I would like to remind once more that we are expecting your questions via Slido, hashtag uh, 4K conference, and let us meet again in 10 minutes. Thank you. First, uh, public procurement that all of you mentioned. Uh, currently, the respective uh, laws, in your opinion, uh, are adequate to strict, uh, not strict enough. Uh, what should it be? What is proper um, governance in various types of companies, like public companies, municipal companies, and others? 
what motivation and initiatives do we have uh, to implement appropriate um, control systems? Uh, do, would those be KPIs or something else? Or uh, will all of us will wait for some uh, tax um, rebates or maybe some other stimuli uh, like being praised? Uh, good governments as a driving force uh, for profits uh, is internal control only an expense item i think these are the topics that are worth discussing and the last that was mentioned information exchange data quality how that can help us uh, better engage better participate in procurement procedures better manage our companies and let us not forget about uh, smes how to motivate them how to prove that the internal control system is also for them Recently, I read a book written by Estonian colleagues about compliance in the money laundering area. And it was interesting that in the introduction, they uh, cited Cicero, namely that the life is simple, but we all tended to make it more complicated all the time. Uh, so maybe we can uh, divide or may, we can split everything in smaller parts and instead of speaking about this as being top complicated, maybe we can speak about how we can introduce that uh, easier and better because we are speaking about all uh, our common property, about public property that belongs to all of us and uh, that uh, was also mentioned by Zlatan Jakobsen and, and many others uh, because this will result in better services and better competitiveness. And we are also a part of the global ecosystem. And please also remember that we will have to uh, deal with uh, sustainable financing concerns. OECD also mentioned DBRD. Uh, namely that in their uh, contracts, uh, this bank introduces good government's uh, anti-corruption measures um, to uh, provide financing to beneficiaries. The finance sector, all the global chains, uh, all of that eventually uh, results uh, ends up with us, so we have to be prepared for better financing and treat the internal control system as a part of uh, the uh, our system also considering the green deal zlata maybe we can start with you uh, since you represent foreign investors and also you are also an auditor and many are asking whether the internal control system involves only internal audit or is much more than that i would like to say that it is a set of measures and it is quite clear that internal audit is an important part and parcel of it because it's a, an inspection body but in general the internal control system begins with whether our employees are trained and whether they understand what is good what is not good what is acceptable in our company and what is not also internal control system expands and speaks about uh, our cooperation conditions what we accept from God, third parties what we don't and what actions do we take because it's clear that internal control system is made for protecting companies during the entire cooperation process because if we have this uh, top-down uh, requirements, but if people don't understand uh, why that is needed and what they should do, I think uh, the results uh, would not be that uh, 
unambiguous because the internal control system is something that uh, helps us implement these uh, plans to be honest, uh, to enter into fair contracts, to offer fair conditions and work and, and, and cooperate uh, and tell internally about our, our general rules and approaches. But it is also clear that our deeds should follow our words and internal auditors as well as any other managers should have processes and control instruments for me to check all of that. But internal controls is a set of measures that allows us to assess whether we are doing the right thing, whether our employees understand what is expected from them, and whether we can follow the main uh, main uh, driving uh, uh, purpose or goal uh, not to uh, cheat. I think Lata was right in saying that everyone should understand what our values are. And, and this is something for all the employees. Linda, you are very inspiring. And I have to say that we have received a question. A message from Inesa Kuscha from State Chancellery, and they uh, would like to praise Riga City Council was for a good uh, implementation of the whistleblowing um, mechanism, and that they have many contact points that have good cooperation with the State Chancellery. So that was an outside assessment of uh, the uh, Riga City Council. But uh, how do you do? You have 15 various municipal companies and each company has its own vision about these aspects. And also by relying on, on uh, OECD study, what um, practical steps you will take for your strategies uh, to become uh, a part and parcel of daily operations? So that it would not be a burden. Uh, maybe it can be included in KPIs or maybe some other parameters. What is your vision? It's quite clear that state and municipal companies uh, have uh, to be uh, have to lead by example and show this example to other companies. Maybe you can tell about this role and how you intend to communicate and show that. Thank you, Ms. Kuscha, for uh, the praise. But considering the fact, uh, yes, of course, that we have done something, we have implemented the whistleblowing system, and now in a year we have to reassess it and uh, see what we can do to make it more uh, efficient, because this fragmentation that we see in the uh, in municipality is quite great. Uh, both also the concerns uh, the um, whistleblowing and also below the threshold procurements. And there are several aspects that should be streamlined and centralized, uh, including uh, preparation of anti-corruption plans. We are uh, a municipal body and we have uh, 53 anti-corruption plans in various units and capital companies, municipal capital companies, and uh, currently we are quite active in re-evaluating them and, and assessing uh, practical steps that we could make uh, to, uh, to reduce uh, the number of documents and uh, transform them into practical action. I have to refer to our internal bylaws uh, that concern uh, management of our companies and also then amendments to the laws that took force uh, on January 1st this year. In uh, our case, the holder of the capital shares is the executive director of the city council. And we politically elected representatives uh, have less access uh, to these uh, companies, but it doesn't mean that we don't have any responsibility as owners. And these uh, rules clearly define 
what is uh, the responsibility of our politicians, especially when we work on the medium term uh, strategy. Uh, for example, what needs to be done by our committees, uh, what should be accepted in the Riga City Council. We also have to ask uh, uh, how tangible is the effect. If we look at the medium term uh, strategies and action plans, but if we look behind uh, and if we look at what we have already achieved, uh, these actions and interest, uh, uh, interest in uh, speaking about these strategies and assessing them and assessing the expected results, for example, KPIs, uh, some specific targets that we should um, achieve. So far, no such criteria have ever existed. So in the nearest uh, future, Next year, we'll have a unique uh, possibility to do that for the first time in Riga City Council. And I have to agree with Miss Gaile, who said that if you are honest, it, it's easier for everyone as to punishments. Our communication and, and channeling our message. I think this is what we will start doing tomorrow when we will invite uh, managers, uh, senior managers, and middle level managers uh, from our companies. Uh, that's when we will uh, provide our message. Uh, what are our main focus points? Uh, what we expect uh, from the point of view of responsibility? And I think um, that during the next year, um, we will focus on education and we'll have to do that systematically. This is what we have, under this, this is what we have understood uh, during these two months uh, that we have been in office because we have had uh, capital municipal capital companies where no such requirements have ever existed. Uh, the um, city council management has never asked for that. So I think we'll have to engage in quite many educational activities. But speaking about all employees, including middle level employees and their awareness. Of course, uh, we would want a much better awareness on the middle level. Uh, so I think we will focus on e-training e-learning because we have several uh, tens, dozens of, uh, uh, of thousands of employees and so far this training has not been systematic so we have never used um, any 21st century tools so far in the Riga City Council like e-training uh, tests uh, making this uh, a mandatory requirement for employees thank you I think this is uh, something that we have been, we have been uh, focusing um, on. I would not like to speak of a crisis, but I think the COVID situation has made us move uh, more forward uh, in the digital area, use of technologies. Uh, and I think this is a question to everyone, so I'm looking at Katrina, uh, but I believe that the rest of you can also comment. Uh, there are three questions asked in Slido and uh, elsewhere. So, in our opinion, where should the internal control system be more uh, powerful, stronger in private or public organizations, or um, they should be equally strong? and how to motivate uh, private companies to implement internal control systems in the company, uh, sorry, in the public companies. Uh, what measures should be taken by the public companies? Katrina, maybe we can start with you, but the rest can uh, join in at any moment they wish. Uh, also maybe Zlata. There is a question about uh, uh, our opinion about the International ISO standard 37001 that pertains to anti corruption systems. Is it suitable for everyone, including small companies? 
Katrīna vārds tev varbūt, tad tu sāc un mēs visu pārējai papildinās. Maybe yeah. Katrina, you can start and the rest I can join in. Uh, thank you for the questions about uh, stronger internal control systems. I think these systems should be in existence and uh, equally strong uh, at all stages because there are several stages so that unfair action, uh, unlawful action uh, would be detected and prevented. We cannot say that only one part or one side should have or the other so side because uh, not uh, all parties are equally involved at all the stages because it's like a chain of cooperation. It, it consists of small links and when you put them together, I think on both sides you should have strong mechanisms. And then we also have to ask how to motivate the private sector to implement these control systems, because on the public side it's an obligation. Because Mr. Strom already mentioned that according to cabinet regulations, these systems should be in existence and they should be operational. And then how to motivate the private sector. I think when we speak with companies, uh, fiscal stimulus always works and it's stronger than other stimuli. It can work both as a carrot and as a, as a whip, as a stick. And from the point of view of, of business, I think we should not focus so much on sticks and maybe think more about carrots. And if, if we have these systems, when companies participate, uh, maybe then these companies uh, would have uh, more favorable conditions. Of course, it's a matter of discussion whether it can be discussed, whether it can be implemented in the EU uh, a national legal framework and also the municipal framework. And also it can be introduced in the procurement qualification requirements. I already mentioned that these standardized uh, qualification requirements uh, guidelines that are prepared together with sectoral associations could be one of the ways for both parties to become a much more uh, knowledgeable about this process and look for potential solutions so that we would not have any weak links, uh, any gaps. But if we return to motivation, I think uh, there could be fiscal motivators and more focus on carrots. Yes, if we look at the questions received by Slido, I would like to return to the SMEs. Šāds komentārs, ko mēs varētu atbildēt šādiem... So what we could reply to the following. A small and medium company has to think how to survive, where to get resources for anti-corruption measures. And your event, your measure is useless because it doesn't give anything to the company, no benefits. So what will happen? Uh, will companies that don't have these good control systems won't be able to participate uh, in uh, the uh, procurement uh, procedures because there are no such legal requirements? So if there are no such requirements uh, stipulated in the law, and if we have uh, public procurement procedures, uh, don't uh, doesn't it has doesn't it have to be made a requirement? namely that only companies which, which have uh, compliant internal control systems are only allowed to participate because small companies can also have uh, internal control systems that are uh, commensurate to their risks. 
and Zlata already mentioned that this is not a set of uh, documents. And also, Mr. Strauma, there is a question uh, to your um, organization. When will you finally put someone in a prison for bribery oh. during public procurement procedures because many processes are just closed without any tangible result? Also, a question to Vijansoni. At political at political level, um, are there any discussions about uh, visa socialization programs for people who have been put into a prison for corruption and bribery? And that uh, maybe you can also tell about the procurement, uh, whether we need these measures. If yes, can it be checked and so on? That's uh, maybe you can start with you. Uh, yes, since I already started speaking. If we speak about, about the internal uh, anti-corruption systems, whether that could serve as uh, as uh, as a condition that would give preference to specific participants. No, it is not set out in the law yet. And uh, if we have companies that have already uh, been involved in violations, uh, and we know that in public procurement procedures there is this component, um, namely your reliability. I think that if you had this control system that has been uh, approved, like uh, has been accepted, found compliant, let's say by CNAB or maybe by the Competition Council, that could serve as a tool for the company to return to the public procurement uh, area, because for many companies, uh, these contracts are very important. Uh, it's even a matter of survival. But as to whether we need uh, uh, this in the public procurement procedure, uh, we have to discuss two things, uh, whether it's normal to uh, ask for this if you don't have the system yourself. So we should be fair towards both parties. We have this system in our organization and then we have the right to ask it from the business. It's the same as with ISO. Yes, we can formally put this in for uh, this requirement, but the contracting party may even have no idea what this is, what they are requiring. But by this, they have uh, excluded uh, SMEs from the procurement procedure uh, because these companies uh, don't have enough resources to implement this ISO. Uh, but the difficult question is whether the system operates and works. Katrin already mentioned that the public sector doesn't have any options because there's uh, there are cabinet uh, requirements. But I think Mr. Straume mentioned that the system is described, it is uh, created, but whether it works. How can establish during a public procure, procurement procedure that uh, the company, even if submit, even it submits something like diagrams and so on to, to me, how can I verify that all of that works? Of course, in a way that can be used, uh, can be included in um, Contractual performance requirements, uh, let's say is that when you enter into the contract, you have to prove that you have the system, that you have clear understanding of the diagram, uh, flowchart, who is responsible for what, uh, what are your principles, what are your codes of uh, ethic and uh, whatever. Uh, Katrina mentions the guidelines. Mm that the sectoral associations have and, and, and the procurement monitoring office has worked on this for some time already and we have had uh, quite good cooperation with specific uh, associations uh, but as to guidelines um, the companies maybe are not so interested uh, are eager to participate because these guidelines are not mandatory yes we can uh, invest resources but no one later uses them and uh, then uh, some strange requirements will be included in procurement procedures that are not um, that are not uh, there to ensure fair competition and, and, and plus are placed there for the benefit of someone else. 
but at the same time, I would like to say that uh, it's not always that uh, there is uh, malicious intent involved because um, there is lack of knowledge about the market and you just don't understand what to put there. Um, and then we can just include everything that we have found somewhere else. Uh, still, the guidelines should be operational in any case, uh, so that those who are willing could at least use this to uh, these uh, guidelines to ensure that um, that their procurement is uh, appropriate. As to carrots and sticks, I think the bad news is that even if we ensure fair competition, we cannot claim that someone uh, has uh, a guaranteed uh, option to win. If you come uh, with your, uh, if you come with your price and and you have uh, prepared your uh, bid, it may still happen that your competitor is more efficient, uh, offers better price, and and you don't win. But on the other hand, we are all interested in uh, everyone knowing the rules of the game, so that everyone understands these rules of the game and that everyone can comply with them. And that we have this conviction that everyone will uh, will comply. So if you don't um, act according to your rules, uh, I think that is demonstrated by the uh, fines imposed on, let's say, members of the procurement commission, because they have uh, granted the right to sign the agreement to someone who doesn't meet the initial requirements. So it means that the rule of the game rules of the game are changed during the game which cannot be accepted uh, during public procurement procedures. I really liked what Linda said about e-training because we started doing that even before the COVID crisis because uh, that is a very good tool to reach much larger audi audience. And as to corruption risks and, and, and uh, competition issues, and I think we have worked together with uh, with the procurement office and, and CNAB um, to have this as a very advanced tool. Thank you. The questions uh, were to you about uh, this uh, function uh, being as a motivator, uh, maybe us uh, being in not such a favorable place uh, from the cor corruption point of view. And then there is a question, maybe you have some good practice examples from companies that have implemented good anti-corruption systems, like after a real corruption um, scandal, or preventively to make sure that no such uh, events take place. Uh, so maybe you can reply uh, to these, uh, this question as to... Uh, as to imprisonment, we don't do that. It's done by the court. We can just investigate uh, administrative procedures, criminal procedures, uh, processes, and in, in criminal cases, uh, further decisions are made by the prosecutor's office and, and the court. What we hear in uh, in, in, in in this area, I think. Uh, Convictions are much more prominent in the public uh, public eyes than whatever we have done before uh, that. According to statistics, uh, yes, uh, the decisions could be stricter, but I cannot really say much more because that can be interpreted as an, uh, as an attempt to influence the court. About sanctions and good uh, practice examples. Yes, we have a good examples. After the uh, latest uh, Latvian ego corruption scandal, many things were done to improve the anti-corruption internal system at this company. I think it would be difficult to assess whether these measures were efficient because we are not uh, fully sure about that, but the company really implemented many measures uh, to at least minimize potential corruption risks, uh, fraud risks, 
they had this responsible respective management plan they also prepared code of ethics uh, impl implemented declaration of conflicts of interest a joint uh, positions uh, also a good training for all the employees reporting mechanisms also about private sector we have some good examples i will not name them but we but we also know that even during investigations the companies have started working so that if they are brought to justice that could mitigate uh, could serve as a mitigating circumstance so they work on internal control mechanisms uh, to ensure compliance and, and to show that the company has uh, has uh, shown its uh, good faith uh, to prevent uh, reoccurrences. Jakob, that would be e e e e times, so Jakobs, why... then I have a short question. Are you planning to implement stricter requirements regarding public procurement? And would only those who have good internal control systems be able to participate? Because that's already answered about it. But what is your opinion as a leading institution? We have to look very carefully so that it uh, do not uh, potentially promote uh, violating the competition competition rules so we have to be very careful how far we go and what could it be in order not to create a situation where uh, somebody uh, has benefits uh, because uh, they were not aware of some reputation risks of reputation or they didn't know any about any corruption cases and that's one and second is that uh, uh, companies are competing uh, each with other and uh, maybe somebody could uh, create reputation risks for others and and that could cause that some of the um, applicants is turned down it would be great if one of the aspects uh, could be a good reputation for the company and uh, um, internal control mechanism is one of the cornerstones for the good reputation and uh, that there were not violations in a specific period of time but i don't think it should be one of the uh, most important factors so there should be a honest competition a fair price reasonable price and also reasonable service and those should be the main conditions to have uh, the contract and the question to all of us those who work in the private companies also state and municipal and it uh, goes together with a question which was asked by colleagues from the state chancellery mrs interlux and also what uh, mr S mr straum just said so when you're selecting employees for uh, executive jobs shouldn't um, excellent reputation be as a requirement and also understanding about corruption should be like prerequisite and in case if there are certain uh, cases of corruption and there isn't a, a proper control system in force shouldn't it be like an automatic uh, reasoning uh, that uh, if the people were selected for specific posts uh, wouldn't it be considered as a violation and also that for those people there is uh, no place in the company anymore so it's question to everyone maybe Zlata can speak about the foreign experience and we would add to it yes i'm trying to define what i'm trying to say so the reputation of the company has a crucial importance in the way how the company operates so of course we understand that the manager of the company is the face of the company so therefore employees and also all the third parties are assessing the attitude uh, towards the risks of corruption and when they are doing this they are looking at the head of the company so therefore i would like to agree that uh, uh, spotless uh, 
recommend uh, reputation is one of the criteria talking about the all all of the companies so both international local companies small and medium sized and large companies because this is one of the main uh, preconditions what uh, I also wanted to add to what Janis uh, said, I, uh, when we put aside the reputation, and maybe somebody else can help me with it, is um, when we talk about the systems of control and implementation of standards. So let us, uh, I'm urging you to be pra pragmatic. I believe if we are able to implement and really operate uh, efficient uh, control systems in the large companies, both international and local large companies, also state and municipal uh, publicly owned companies, then uh, there is already a large part of the work to be done. It's already done because that would promote uh, also um, good changes in a small companies because those processes are continuous. We see if in the bank sector, the banks started to uh, question uh, entrepreneurs about their internal control systems and they were offering better commercial conditions and offering uh, better collaboration conditions in general. And that uh, helped, and uh, that helped uh, all the sector and also whole country. So I would like to wish uh, to all of us to prioritize uh, things and start with the most important. Uh, what is the most important? It's the large companies, the state um, publicly owned companies, and uh, uh, companies uh, which are the largest and that would bring uh, the correct attitude and set the right tone in the country, whole country. Thank you, Zlata. I believe that our audience understands if we talk about the large companies. It doesn't mean that me as a small company, I am just uh, uh, freely swimming around and I'm not unnoticed. I am unnoticed. Uh, it is clear that the large companies in the industries where requirements are higher, our responsibility is uh, so stronger. And uh, thank you to Zlata for good words. You spoke about the industry I'm representing and I've been working in this for a long time and sustainable for sustainability for the next years. I believe that uh, Katrina agrees and others that uh, sustainability issues are going to be very important for the uh, next uh, tens of uh, years. And uh, therefore, all of us, we have to prepare for this and um, so that it's not like Zlata says that we are talking about unfair uh, competition and that somebody has done something and uh, therefore the funding is more expensive for him. And Zlata also answered to the question that there will be uh, this mandatory requirement uh, to implement the standard 37001 in the companies. And it was said that uh, already before that this is not a goal as itself. We are talking about efficient control system. If this standard helps and uh, Yes, why not? But to implement the quality system just for formally, uh, this is wrong. So let us now turn to the next topic. All that is related to the educating, communication, whistleblowing. And um, uh, let us start with a question to all of us. The companies are are asking this question they are saying we are companies uh, smaller and maybe not so small maybe larger companies so what should we how should we start to implement this control system how would uh, public and um, ngos and other organizations help us and should the company start from the scratch and that was first of all the question to the corruption prevention bureau 
talking about the guidelines. Actually, Datsa said was very skeptical about guidelines, but guidelines as a as a genre um, uh, should or shouldn't be developed. So, Katrin, the question: Would guidelines help to your organization and members of your organization? I believe that in the previous part of the discussion, we already touched upon the question that the system has to exist uh, on uh, on its merits. So it uh, has uh, to operate in reality because you can write it in a nice words and have the scheme, but uh, the management of the company, the executives uh, no, don't uh, understand it. and. Uh, don't make it live, then it doesn't have this uh, added value in the end. And the technical document with guidelines, how to do it correctly, how to outline it on the paper is, would be very uh, useful, but uh, that has to come in a set uh, together with the uh, be, desire so and the wish of oh, no, the company to change their okay. operational model and to implement uh, those yeah, uh, systems uh, yeah. on, on the merits. And if we speak about uh, small and medium companies and what their resources, we have discussed about it in our um, um, chamber and and uh, public procurement, this is the public money, the state's money. Money we have paid in taxes, all of us. So this money and the way how it is spent and who is spending it and when, there should be more monitoring and control from all the involved parties, in, also including uh, from the companies. And uh, this is uh, in some in a, some way a privilege to be in this system and to participate in public procurement. But it requires from the companies to to open up and to become more transparent, to show their activities, uh, to become more transparent uh, than in comparison uh, if uh, there is only operation between two private companies. Also, uh, for that, uh, from the OECD, we heard that the large companies, when they are buying something from the smaller companies, they are also requiring the same uh, things uh, which are outlined in the large public procurement. So we are moving towards the transparency, openness, and this is a logical demand. And we have to understand it, we have to move towards it and change our way of thinking. And then together with uh, practical and technical guidelines how to do it, we will have a very good set of the way how to uh, spend this public money in the best way getting the good and uh, reasonable service for reasonable price and also ensuring uh, the comp uh, the competition between the companies and thus we reduce at least a part of the risks uh, thank you linda uh, would these guidelines uh, help you uh, would it help uh, you to have better governance in your uh, company of course it has to be risk based and uh, uh, but the guidelines as a genre we we know that this is a soft law but uh, would it help is the question to linda uh, guidelines of course are very useful and regarding uh, publicly owned companies in our regulation, it is already a duty that uh, there should be such, but only it's only three months since uh, these reg this regulation uh, has come into force, and uh, we we have our deadlines when uh, they should be elaborated. But uh, uh, reflecting on what we've been discussing already, it is very important for us uh, to be aware that there is a human individual behind everything and his attitude and his uh, thinking. 
Katarina just spoke about uh, responsibility, how we spend taxpayers' money. And um, I remember that in the 90s, I was studying Norwegian language. And I remember that she was uh, the teacher of uh, Norwegian, was speaking about taxpayers' money so much, and we hadn't heard it so much. And uh, we needed some tens of years until we also started using this term. So this is a taxpayer's money. This is not uh, some uh, mystical state money, but uh, it is. Uh, it has become a normal a normality uh, to uh, speak about uh, taxpayer's money, and everybody have to be aware of that at, uh, at the deepest level and understand that this is our common responsibility. I would like to step one a step back, and when we speak about uh, governance and reputation, I forgot to speak. One of the things Riga has changed in relation to publicly owned companies is the way how we elect uh, the members of the boards and uh, um, also the members of councils. Uh, the process of uh, nomination has changed. Uh, so 11 have been elected, nine are in the process. and. And this is a very essential step where we stop uh, from the top down. We ensure um, the transparent uh, criteria based way how we elect the representatives, the members of the board. And they are not uh, uh, chosen uh, due to affiliation to the political party and so that there are conflicts of interest. And, and this is also one of the things in which we can be proud that uh, small step by small step, we are implementing this uh, uh, good and transparent governance in our um, system. Yes, this is also answer to the colleague who is saying that the Cabinet of Minister regulation about establishing the control systems in the public uh, institutions have to be implemented more efficiently, and then many things would solve. Uh, many issues would solve because if we ask only to the uh, private companies, their costs would increase. So uh, this is um, not a question. This is a, a wish uh, for the public uh, institutions to implement it. And uh, also it is binding also for all the companies. Uh, so we still are receiving quite a lot of uh, questions from the small companies who are not uh, members of the association. They want to uh, implement their uh, control systems. And where can they receive the support? Uh, I don't know. This question, Jacobs, goes to you. So uh, who could recommend uh, how for the small company how to establish uh, the control system? So. Um, uh, if you have a short question, you can ask me. I would be happy to help. But yeah, Jakob, uh, I would like to ask you about the system. So where could those companies turn to, to get help? I would like to remind about uh, Link, uh, OECD representative uh, mentioned. Uh, where there is this study available, what they have researched and also concluded, and uh, the basic principles, basic places where the problems exist. And based on that, we could uh, think how to organize this system. And second is that I don't think that the internal control system uh, has to be the same size and same uh, um, model same pattern as uh, in the large company like like it was said that uh, depending it uh, this control system has to be created and established based on the risks and for the small companies uh, the all the operations are uh, easier uh, to control they are more transparent and uh, if uh, everyone who makes decisions or participate in this decision making in those companies and they want to act honestly i believe that there are no big problems with uh, corruption risks between medium and larger companies uh, um, it is a different case uh, especially if uh, 
before that the, the executives of the company wanted it. So from our side, we organize training. There are guidelines. We organize training how and what to do in the uh, state uh, institutions and we offer the training and also train the trainer system the ones who will afterwards train others about the guidelines and what should be done we also get to know and we request uh, the internal uh, control plans and how this is organized in the institution institution and this is quite large scale on job because there are a lot of uh, public institutions but i also wanted to point out that this is a uh, very important for our office because uh, we also want uh, to put take off the burden on our resources and um, and if we talk about this external control that uh, we um, as a corruption prevention bureau and uh, state uh, control uh, is uh, controlling externally but at the same time we want uh, everywhere to have internal control system and uh, the executives the, the board of the company not just uh, want uh, to have those uh, plans formally on the paper but that they are really implemented and the good governance principles and fair play principles about distribution of uh, the money should be in in force because like it was said it is uh, taxpayers money yes uh, thank you very much so we have another 10 minutes i would like to talk about the training and communication and feedback issues and a very short question i wanted to ask to everyone when we spoke about uh, so-called under threshold uh, procurements in slido there are several recommendations that uh, we have to adopt uh, regulation about uh, under thresholds uh, procurements and and uh, set rules how to organize them and not to, to step aside from them and then everything would be fine and we wouldn't need to create additional complicated systems so is it a correct um, idea or it's uh, not enough just with some regulation and that wouldn't solve all the issues related to the under threshold uh, procurement so this is a question to everyone so the ones who have the opinion please express it nobody has raised a hand but Zlata, as you started you spoke about it uh, please uh, could you comment on that and then we will ask to linda Yes, talking about uh, the under threshold uh, procurements, I have a uh, dual, dual feelings towards it because uh, often I think we have to understand and uh, there should be maybe a more detailed study in um, which sectors and where there are problems and issues related to the under threshold uh, procurement what i feel the entrepreneurs uh, face the most is that uh, bigger procurement is divided into several smaller under threshold in procurement in order to shorten the length of the process and uh, uh, make the procedures uh, easier and also impact the fair competition and so on but in order to solve the problems with under threshold the procurement uh, there are two things first of all we have to analyze whether this threshold is uh, 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 proper isn't it too high or too low and it has to be reassessed because as a mechanism of activity it uh, is changing so these thresholds uh, should uh, be reviewed time by time and to see 
what is the adopted minimum not only in latvia but in the whole european union and we also have to take action and uh, look for the ways how to solve how to tackle this issue looking at the risks because otherwise um, I, I want to say that maybe somebody might dislike it, but we, we have to be very rational. There has to be an opportunity to uh, procure for uh, smaller uh, scale services, not to, to complicate uh, life for both contracting party and contractor. There should be uh, such a procedure, uh, it should exist for, for it. And of course, if we talk about violations, we have to work can tackle them. Uh, that's and Linda, uh, if I may, please. Uh, regulation in the uh, in the uh, within the law, I, I I don't believe we need to have it. We already have the Article Nine, and this is not enough. And we want uh, to have also appealing procedure. And uh, if we put uh, again lower thresholds uh, again there will be appeal procedure and so on uh, so therefore i totally agree that we should uh, agree which is um, the uh, specific threshold um, um, in which we give this internal freedom uh, for uh, contracting entities uh, but everything has to be done in the best interest of the taxpayers and also I agree about reviewing the uh, thresholds. Uh, uh, I must say that historically we have reviewed it for several times, but it has to be based on the statistics of, about our uh, system, um, uh, what, what happens, what is the proportion between uh, those procurements. And also we have to analyze what the colleagues in other countries are doing. So uh, this uh, threshold uh, in uh, every country is determined and uh, not uh, that uh, since uh, starting already with uh, euro one uh, you have to do all all, all things and linda what about you uh, from the point of view of riga city council we see that a large part of our budget is used uh, using the under threshold procedures and when we um, look at this part, we cannot leave it uh, unsupervised. We also need to regulate, uh, to, to look, to control it. And this, uh, we have noticed that this regulation in our uh, uh, structural units is uh, very different. And sometimes it is uh, quite, uh, um, all, all the system is not well regulated and uh, sometimes even uh, not uh, some things are not documented so there should be um, regulation we should uh, be made sure that several applicants uh, were involved for example if we are doing some construction works uh, and um, if we don't uh, uh, achieve this threshold but we are very close to it and and there are no um, specific contracts uh, so there are different systems, but uh, we are we are in favor of uh, equal uh, competitiveness and transparent process, and uh, we have to take into account the specific of each uh, structure of each um, institution. So this um, uh, determining united principles is needed in our municipality, but still taking into, into account the uh, differences. So Katrin, what about you? You as an entrepreneur, how would you do as a... I would like to separate uh, this idea that a bigger procurement is divided into smaller. 
I believe that this is the correct um, action. This is the way how we involve uh, small and medium companies. But it has to be communicated that it was a larger uh, procurement, which was divided into smaller parts. And it shouldn't be always like under threshold procurement. This is just a, another um, regulation, uh, the way how to involve um, more participants, get more competition and get better uh, product or service. About the under thresholds, um, procurement, the discussion always is topical. And also here in the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, it is um, always alive. And uh, we have quite a lot uh, um, improved. And um, in the beginning, we were speaking about uh, transferring the procurements to the digital environment. We have electronic procurement system. We have centralized procurement. So it is uh, uh, possible to, to get all the small things uh, using the catalog. They're no, not always are small things, but uh, in general, the centralized procurement. And, then, and second is the electronic procurement system, which has to be as widely as possible. So uh, all procurements should uh, go through this uh, system, also contracts and announcements. And so this transparency is uh, ensured for all the involved parties. And that would reduce uh, the, the risks of corruption and that would also leave the freedom for the contracting party to um, make a choice so we would um, balance uh, the interests of all sides like this Thank you. And now we have returned to technologies yet again and the importance of technologies. I think we have slightly overused our time, but at the very end, uh, maybe we can focus on a very important uh, pillar of the internal control and all of you have mentioned it, namely training. And I think Linda's uh, idea about training uh, that should not be sporadic or emotional. I think that is very uh, relevant. That's uh, how do you organize uh, training at your body? Because quite often we hear that uh, at the end of the year, and if we speak about oh, procurement and corruption, you know, everyone wants training and wants it now. So you just have to tick this job is being done, that the training was uh, completed. Uh, in your opinion, what could be the right training program for the procurement purposes and, and what we um, could do uh, to reduce the corruption risks uh, in pro public procurement as a result of proper training, so that this would be known by all the employees and specific bodies? Yes, it's a very good question. And when I uh, uh, left the procurement monitoring office, I think that they were still working on a very important task as they cooperated with uh, public procurement, uh, with the state administration school um, uh, to uh, create uh, a training uh, according to the EU uh, competence framework uh, for participants of public procurement procedures. Uh, so that it would be possible to establish uh, competences that are required for specific uh, participants of the process, like um, a member of the procurement commission or chairman of the commission and so on. So that this training would include not only uh, legislative amendments or specific topics, uh, but to have a comprehensive approach and to use various training methods, including practical training, e-training, uh, various modules, tests, that was the purpose uh, to have a, to have a targeted approach to training so that we could safely, safely claim that if a person has completed all the modules, this person is able to understand what is public procurement, because you have to understand that those who engage in public procurement, they require extensive competences. For example, they have to know about the laws 
and those who work in this area, they say that these laws are very complicated. They also have to know about the market, how the private sector functions and the private market functions, especially in the area where procurement is organized. They also have to uh, have economic and financial knowledge uh, to assess the financial bids at a good professional level. So you really need uh, quite extensive knowledge. You also have to know the competition, uh, competition law and the corruption risks. So what we do now together with the, state, with the public administration school is uh, we work uh, on, on, on this extensive training program and we also think a lot about e-training. Currently the procurement monitoring office already has a module for uh, complete beginners. So if I don't know anything, I can read this and at least get some basic idea about what are the procedures, what steps should be made, uh, made and so on. And uh, e-training on further steps is also being prepared, like planning, for example, um, contractual amendments and so on. Thank you. Uh, Linda. Uh, Thank you, you, Linda. Uh, training technologies. How do you ensure is that your training is not sporadic, but systematic and very targeted? I'm really happy that the public administration school is also working in this area. And uh, as a municipality, we would definitely be interested in cooperating and I will uh, convey this message to my colleagues. Uh, and maybe we system. could even work on a common training module system that can be used by the public bodies as well as our municipality so that we would uh, reach a win-win solution. I have to say that here uh, in Riga, in our municipality, uh, we are basically working on something that is completely new for us because we don't have any precedents, we don't have any such training, uh, we have never had, but we see a lot of potential in that. And not only in the area of these digital tools, uh, because I already mentioned open data at the beginning of this discussion because we think that that is a very important tool that ensures uh, transparency. Of course, we have to strengthen our IT systems and we require investment there to uh, upgrade them. But this is definitely a target uh, towards which we move. And that is in the interest of the municipality, also the bodies that manage the budget and the public. Thank you, Katrina Zlata. Maybe you, Zlata. Maybe you can um, speak about the internal control systems, trainings, how to implement them better to ensure that it's not a formal exercise. Maybe, Karina, you can also speak about that. As a representative of the private sector, we as an international company, Price Waterhouse Coopers, um, for us, it's a mandatory exercise. We have to complete this kind of training twice per year, and it's a mandatory requirement. And I would really like to encourage everyone that uh, you should focus on um, various aspects of ethics, fair competition, anti-corruption issues. All of this is very, very important from the point of view of management, as well as employees who now understand that we really focus on this area. And I would also like to say that this training can be very, very interesting uh, also for the employees because technologies give us many opportunities, including virtual reality, escape rooms, uh, where you can really provide a very interesting content to the employees that motivates them. Also, if we work together, and if we integrate testing mechanisms into training mechanisms, and, uh, and if we set KPIs, namely what we want to achieve, I think this complex uh, approach uh, could uh, deliver this positive uh, positive approach and positive uh, way forward. Thank you. 
Katrina. Very briefly, because we have to finish, I think Ms. Gaile was very right in mentioning all the skills and knowledge uh, and educational needs uh, that uh, we have from the point of view of contractual authority of customer and uh, we really would like to see knowledgeable uh, contracting authorities so that they would see the entire field it's critically important to improve the quality and here i'm speaking about specifications uh, process quality procedural quality that could uh, help to uh, reduce the number of appeals and also uh, make the procurement processes shorter since this is uh, like yet another uh, elephant in the room which we didn't mention today so this educational uh, aspects uh, on both sides is very very important technologies is something that uh, generates added value and it's a reality that you should be able to use smartly thank you jacobs uh, about education as a supervisory body do you expect that in uh, in the education programs uh, one would include whistleblowing and by that i think we could uh, uh, we could finish and, and and say thank you to all the speakers and, and, and guests so but before we do that uh, and we conclude this panel so what is your opinion about education and inclusion of whistleblowing aspects should whistleblowing be included in these educational measures so what do you expect Yes, I would definitely expect that uh, whistleblowing um, aspects are included in regular training to explain in a meaningful way what is whistleblowing, because uh, you may remember that at the beginning when this law was still being drafted and when it was uh, adopted, uh, many uh, misleading information was um, disseminated in the society, um, for example, about its purpose. But as to education in other areas, where uh, our office uh, finds education very important. For a long period of time, we have cooperated with the Procurement Monitoring Office and the Public Administration School. So we offer uh, training modules uh, to thousands of uh, public uh, employees per year. And we train on various issues like uh, in conflicts of interest, procurement aspects and so on. And also the risks that should be noticed, uh, discovered for the persons involved in in, in this uh, in these processes uh, to um, to rectify them i would like to focus now on uh, under the threshold procurement procedures in 2017 when the new public procurement law was adopted and the office analyzed uh, the current situation and we have to remember that these, uh, this type of procurement and the respective uh, legal framework is based on uh, EU regulation, so there is not much room for uh, uh, for um, change, but uh, according to the statistics, I think uh, we established that approximately 1 billion euros were spent on these under the threshold procurement procedures and i think we definitely need uh, one uh, single regulatory framework that was well uh, that was our opinion that could be like cabinet regulations or, or or in any other way i don't know how it's going to work now or how it's going to be implemented but this problem do it does exist uh, and uh, there is no single um, legal framework. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
Thank you. I have to admit, I didn't follow this, uh, but it was so interesting that we overused our time and we have to finish uh, quite soon. Uh, we have managed to answer most questions, but there are still some outstanding questions. I think Jakob's uh, we could still keep talking about uh, all the pillars uh, that we mentioned uh, as being part of the internal control system. Uh, we could spend much more time on them, uh, like uh, compliance of inter internal control function, uh, internal audit, and many others, and also, not the least, uh, appropriate training, data availability, use of technologies. I think we could speak about that uh, during an entire conference, and we could devote a conference to each of these aspects. So maybe uh, that is um, a proposal that can be implemented later. But I would like to say a huge thank you to all the participants, to Dr. Zlata, Katrina, Linda, uh, Jakobs uh, for participation. I hope that this uh, event was useful. For me, it was useful very useful and uh, we had a discussion because we had questions and i think the question was which means that the question was asked uh, correctly thank you for everyone who participated have a good holiday season take care of yourself and everyone around you and uh, if there's still interest in this you can still uh, stay here and continue speaking but uh, we have to close this event we have to end this event Thank you and have a nice uh, day. Tad uh, laiks ir laiku esam nedaudz pārtērējuši uh, un uh, mēs ar Jākabu tad varbūt arī noslēgsim daži. As uh, already mentioned, uh, we have overspent our time and now we have to close the conference. Maybe some logistical issues, uh, questions about availability of the recording. Mm -hmm. Colleagues from CNAP informed that the recording of this event will be available immediately after the event on their Facebook account and also in uh, their uh, event section. The main idea is, even during crisis, systems should be adjusted instead of being cancelled. It is clear that the internal control system uh, is something that constantly develops. And it will not just work formally by relying on the legal acts. It is very important and in particular for the management uh, to be engaged in this work. It is also very important uh, for the large companies, international companies and also state and municipal companies um, and their role uh, to uh, have a proper role in the internal control system. And it is important for the society and other businesses because that uh, stimulates the competitiveness of the entire ecosystem it is also ensures uh, it is also important to ensure that we have a risk appropriate education system and as important is to ensure a efficient exchange of data and use of technologies during all of these processes also the internal control system does not consist uh, just uh, of uh, anti corruption measures it also includes uh, or it is also important for the companies to ensure that companies are competitive. In particular, if we speak about long-term financing, uh, long-term development, sustainable development, and this will be important uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, availability of financing, prices uh, or pricing of the financing. Uh, it was also mentioned by the OECD researchers uh, because they claim that compliance should not be perceived as a cost item because this function can help all of us become more efficient uh, more profitable um, better exporters smarter and stronger those were the main ideas and now the floor goes to Jacobs uh, to close this event thank you I would like to say a huge thank you to all the part, all the panelists. 
also to the public administration school as uh, we uh, organize this conference together. Also, a huge thank you to the moderator uh, for uh, doing great during the discussion. I'm sure that this will not be the last time uh, for us uh, to uh, discuss these issues as well as other important issues. I wish you uh, calm, healthy holiday season and Happy New Year. I hope that the next year will be much better than this year. Definitely, it's going to be much better. Uh, good health to all of you and take care of you. Thank you and goodbye.